Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 601, and I'm not wearing a black polo, so clearly it's Casual Friday. That's all I got to say, Casual Friday. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's June 5th, 2020. All right, welcome to another show. Uh, and it's when I say Casual Friday, it really is because I don't even have show notes in front of me. I know the number of the show, which is 601. I remember I have a quick introduction where I guys tell, tell you guys, like the show to death. Keep clicking those like buttons. We love that on Facebook and YouTube. Please share this program. You guys are sharing more and more, and that helps the show a lot. Please comment. Uh, I escaped so much ridicule last week by your comments. I thought for sure, you know, Kevin talking about race would have been the end of my, my career in public, uh, <laughs> in public journalism. But no, you guys are very kind. And so we, we appreciate the comments, we read the comments, and uh, dodged a bullet comment. So I appreciate that very much. Let me turn off the, the stock market is up today as the jobless rate continues to uh, go down as People are going back to work after this pandemic. And George, I'll talk a little bit about the mass situation in a minute. What have I Oh, the most important part of being a viewer, subscribing to the program. We have some almost 6,000 subscribers. Now in the whole scheme of things, that's not a lot. I understand. There's a guy named Cutie Pie, millions of subscribers, hundreds of millions, tens of whatever. And we're down here at the 6,000 level for an Anglican uh, analytical program that's top-notch 6,000 is is a solid number for subscribers George how are you doing down there in Florida very 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 busy yeah um, I see you get your clerics on yeah I gotta work uh, <laughs> no I, um, I'm uh, we've been doing online services and people have loved it and we've just we do it we, right now we're doing two online services and an online sunday school for the elementary school children and people have been really and we do it across several platforms youtube facebook parish website um all this and that and people have been very supportive and watching and we even we have people from outside the congregation watching but We've got people writing saying, well, I like all our old traditional right one service, and you have some kid with a guitar and a Grateful Dead poster on his wall playing hymns. Can't we just have the organist? And then I have other people writing, oh, why can't we just do more contemporary and reach young people? And so basically, we're not going to have two services online plus Sunday school on Sunday. We're going to have right one, no music, followed by right two with guitarists and our praise group and that's the new normal well yeah but yeah i mean that's a that's a rough problem to have though offer offering more and more services you know a lot of churches after this pandemic are going to be locking the doors and closing them forever so uh you know congratulations in this this time of uh, desolence and pestilence that you uh, are spreading the gospel and people are listening and, and uh, maintaining and coming to faith. Well, people still want to get married. People are still dying. People mm -hmm. are still having, well, now they're able to have operations again mm -hmm. uh, for a while, unless it was you had a heart attack, you had to wait. So people, I just had uh, a nice little chunk of my arm taken out at the skin doctors. Uh, I've had, I have parishioners down at the Moffa Ca Cancer Center who've had to wait six weeks for major surgery for invasive cancers until the all clears were given and then it was so backed up you know if you got two months uh, worth of backed up surgeries these major hospitals just can't do them all on the week uh life goes on uh, yesterday i went to the hospice house to give last rites and uh final uh the meeting with a, a longtime parishioner a lovely woman who was dying of a brain tumor and it just shows where we are today as opposed to where we were two weeks ago. Walk up to the door of the hospice house, no visit, only two people in a room, everyone must wear masks at all times, no one may sit in the waiting room, uh, you must be six feet apart at all times, all the all the rules that were right, right, uh, written by our government, yeah, sure. 
So I walk in, and there's a lady at the front desk. She's not wearing a mask. I, I look down and I see that, oh, her family's in there. And so I say to the, my wife who came with me to for the visit, Susan, you're going to have to wait in the car. And the woman said, oh, no, it's okay. You can go in. Waiting room's packed. Nobody's wearing a mask. And so, I mean, I actually feel a little dumb. I'm the only, Susan and I are the only ones wearing masks. We go in. Whole family's in there. Um, and, of course, we did a lovely, you know, departo Christian soul out of this world uh, mm. in the name of the Father who redeems you, the Son who sanctifies you. Yeah. Absolutely. Wow. The, cool. the, but the thing is, that stuff continues that people are still going to die, even though the government doesn't want them to uh, break six foot regulations. Mm. Pe people still, I have a lovely young couple who were going to have a 200 person wedding uh, at the end of June, and they've been working on this for months. It's now going to be at uh, an outdoor pavilion at a local golf club. It's down to 12 people. And I hate it. I would hate it for this girl to realize in three weeks' time she could have 200 people if they're in golf carts six feet apart. <laughs> uh, in other words, the people are getting on with their lives no matter what the government says or does. Actually, if she required them to come in riot gear, she could have all 200 uh, in the church. Um, I, you just got to be more uh, creative in how you have your, your congregation present. So uh, you just, it's how you dress. If you dress as a church person, you're probably going to get arrested. You dress as a rioter, you're free to go to church. Well, if I just put on a black bandana and wore That's black right. boots, do you think this outfit would allow me to break the uh, six-foot rules? You're good. You are good to go. Um, let's talk about uh, Church of England because I, I want to start with the craziest news. Uh, Archbishop of York got in a little Twitter oh, spot. Kev Kevin, oh, we need oh, yeah. to, just, just so that our friends understand our terms of reference. Okay. The Episcopal Church will, by definition, always be the craziest. Yeah, absolutely. But Kevin and I have a recurring joke. He says, what do, what do we do? It's not a joke, but it's, <laughs> it's a <real>. recurring motif. <laughs> George, what do you want to talk about? Well, I got another story about Indian corruption. <laughs> Four. <laughs> okay, what yeah. else do you have? <laughs> I have a story about Episcopal Church kookiness. Mm. Well, unless Catherine Jeffrey Shore is involved, it's not news. Mm. So when we say the most outrageous thing, it's the most outrageous thing among people who should be normal. That's we right. don't expect <laughs> the Episcopal well, Church leaders to be normal. Anymore. No, well, the leaders of the, the Church of England, uh, the archbishops, uh, took up their white shaming campaign this week and uh, put out a couple of videos and press statements and uh, said to white people, you just don't understand. And that was wonderful to hear from a white person. But uh, apparently Archbishop York got a little Twitter spat um, because he supports this revolt going on. George, why could he re support revolt when he doesn't let people into his churches? This is what the principal of St. Stephen's House in Oxford is asking. And there's several things to be said about this. Mm -hmm. the, Epis the Church of England, English people are, I think, by maybe culture or character, more deferential to hierarchy and authority. Mm. As Kevin and I have amply demonstrated, we, we're not in the United States. We have we so much like talking about the Wicked Witch of the East. Mm. Uh, North, south, south, west, yeah. yeah. Catherine Jeffrey <laughs> Shore. And it's very hard for English people uh, to go all George and Kevin. Well, the the principal of St. Stephen's House just went, did a Kevin and a George towards the Archbishop of York. Now, to help place it, uh, not nothing, analogies are never good, but St. Stephen's House, you could sort of call the, the Neshota House of the Church of That's England. It's the ritualist right, yeah. seminary. Maybe a little more liberal Catholic than the Shota House, but these things change. Uh, it's, and pr principles of theological colleges rely upon the bishop's goodwill to get students and to keep funding going. And so they've got to play ball. They just can't mouth off whenever they feel like it. Uh, they're not independently financially secure, so they, it doesn't matter if they say boo. Well, John Satamu was tweeting, uh, isn't it fantabulous or some sort of word like that, that people are marching in London to support Black Matters, Black Lives Matter, arm in arm to condemn white supremacy and racism. 
And the principal of St. Stephen's House says, challenges Sentamu publicly, saying, you are the same guy who's threatening clergy disciplinary measures, you and your colleagues, against people who allow, against clergy who go into their church to live stream, who will not reopen churches. It's okay to march arm in arm against white supremacy, but it's not okay to sit six feet apart in a church. You can't stop and pray on your way to the protest, but you can protest. Well, not only that, he is an oppressor. St. Stephen's house is that yeah. public health concerns are driven by are driven by political considerations. Mm -hmm. But if, he, if it's a it's a, if it's a favored political viewpoint, you can throw out all of the admonitions and hectoring. The Church of England's leadership is just from for Americans, it's ridiculous. But one of their little mantras is, "We must save, we must save the NHS." I couldn't care less about the NHS, and not and that's why you can't be in church with other people. You can't be within six feet apart. You must be six feet apart if you do anything. Well, that flies out the window when it has to do with politically favored events. So, Welby, uh, I'm sorry, Sintamu responds to this basically saying, well, I'm out of here in two weeks anyway, so it doesn't matter what I say. I'm still going to be preening and do social, social virtue signaling. And But here's, for me, what the telling thing is. Not that Sentamu is a fool. I've always thought he was a bit of a fool and a showboat and a showman. He, he, not, he wasn't always that way. He I wasn't always that, that way, but he's just gone around the bend a good many years now. Yeah. But the principal of a theological college is willing to smack down the Archbishop of York and smack him down successfully. That tells you in what low contempt. The Spectator had a piece, the British Spectator, by a woman named Susan Hill, who basically made the comment that bishops are now an optional extra in English life. Instead of being out there talking about the morality of death, about the praying for people who are dying, about there being a calm and soothing and loving face in the midst of the pandemic, they're busy holding their Zoom meetings, talking about climate change, picking on British political advisors. They're absolutely, totally worthless. You look, you've, Britain, Church of England, you've lost the principal St. Stephen's house. You lost the spectator. You lost, you're losing everybody who you would at one time thought was necessary for your self-esteem. Um, you're doing, you're, you, not the, not the people in the pews, not the rank and file clergy, but the establishment, man, you've lost it. Throughout my life, I've enjoyed studying history. I'm not a historian by any measure, but, uh, I always pick up on things in a historical context. And my favorite teacher, uh, Mr. Burroughs, he was a high school uh, history teacher, and I went to his Chinese history, his Russian history classes, and I took something from him every semester, and it was wonderful. But he always said, Kevin, and to his always class, history always repeats itself. And in a large portion, what you're seeing today and yesterday and for the last month, six month, year, this presidency, the previous presidency, it's just a repeat of history. It, it's repeating itself, it's looping itself. You know, this time we're going to do the writing correctly. This time we'll do race relations again correctly. This time we'll handle the pandemic correctly. This time we'll handle unemployment, the economy, uh, handing out welfare checks, handing out unemployment checks, we'll do it right. And there's no right way to do it because we never address the core issues. We always think the core issue is race and not uh, enmity. We always think the core issue is the economy and not uh, uh, what we spend the money on. And we, until we understand these core issues, I think we're just gonna continue this cycle of repeating until in another 10 or 12 years, we have another race riot. We'll have another pandemic in, in a sense. I think we always look for the, the minor 
issue that we can have a virtual signaling of and make ourselves feel better about, but we ever never look at uh, enmity as being the root cause, that it's a fallen world, that some things can't be fixed until we fix hearts. And how, how we... Uh... How we frame the issue derives the conversation. Mm -hmm. I wasn't in Minneapolis. I was not at the White House, at the Lafayette Park when all these controversial things happened. I would, uh, I do not know what was in the mind of the policeman who uh, was, who was at there at the death of uh, George Floyd. What I do know is that many in society and especially in the church immediately responded to racism took me a few days to finally learn that there were four policemen there, the man who had his knee on the neck of George Floyd, and then his partner, a Chinese man, and then two more cops, an Asian man, an Asian Chinese policeman, and a Hispanic policeman. And there's no evidence that there was racism here, yet uh, from a pure, straight, uh, critical approach. What evidence do we have? None. Can we read the man's mind? None. Was he just a was he just one of these bad apples you get in the police who'd like to join because they like guns and to show off authority? Could be. I don't could know. Be. He, could, he, could he be a racist? Yes, he could. Could very uh, well uh, be. Absolutely. Um, but there, until we reach that point where racism, where racism, is uh, can be found to be a contributing factor. To frame it as racism, as so many politicians and especially the media and clerics. do, and clerics, is to set a frame on the issue. Now, if you frame this issue as a consequence of sin, of uh, brutality, of brokenness, of not, you know, our psalm this morning, our psalm on Sunday is Psalm eight. You know, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Um, God created men, and if you worship the Lord, you must. Uh, be kind and loving to that whom, which he created as well, men and women. Um, so if you frame it as sin, if you frame it as, uh, or you could take a uh, Marxist approach and, and frame it along uh, class lines. Where I live in Florida, poor whites, which are the majority, are essentially no different from poor blacks. In other words, the same rates, not, maybe not exactly the same, but the culture of absentee fathers, of uh, drug abuse, of uh, broken moral values is not unique to any one racial group. It's more of a class phenomenon. And I think actually if uh, the people whom uh, Mitt Romney and uh, uh, Hillary Clinton and now Joe Biden despised uh, Joe Biden is now going off about the deplorables and the 10 to 15 percent who are always going to be bad. The deplorables, whether the 10 or 15 percent or 48 percent, according to Mitt Romney, have more in common with each other across the racial line than they do with their liberal betters who are who are basically maintaining their power in society by dividing the working poor and the non-working poor. So it's how you frame the issue. And if you frame it, if if all you and if all you've got is a hammer, if all you, every problem is going to be pounded as if it were a nail. It, there's a, uh, how should I put this? Most people don't have original thoughts. They follow well, well oiled mm -hmm. tracks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I agree and I disagree with you, Kevin, that history repeats itself. I agree that men repeat themselves. People will do stupid things again and again and again. And institutions made up of men will do stupid things again and again and again. But I also agree with Peter O'Toole and Lawrence of Arabia, who tells Omar Sharif, That's nothing so is written. written. That's right. <laughs> you can make your own destiny. You can make your own life. Mm -hmm. That's the American dream. That's the American way, that your color, your gender, your background does not doom you to any particular outcome in life. It, but you will have a different journey to get there. Yes. And, you know, a uh, harder journey? Yeah, it could be harder. Um, uh, difficult? Yeah, it, it's different. It's it's unique. Um, I, I had grown up in, in northern Wisconsin, and 
there the poverty was amongst and i'm going to use this in quotes because you know it, it's a horrible thing to say white trash was uh where people would refer to these people uh who were impoverished and on welfare and i uh, had the broken families the father you know were brought up fatherless and um i didn't out so my in my younger years i didn't have the identity which a person who grows up in uh, Atlanta or Boston or other places where they hear that there's a crime on the radio, they instantly think it's a black person. When I hear that there's a crime on the radio, because of my, my upbringing uh, in Northern Wisconsin, I thought, I'm quotes here, don't don't hear me wrong, I thought white trash. So yeah. you replay the movie Deliverance again <laughs> <Just> and again, <laughs> toothless hillbillies. Um, <laughs> Just like, and so, you know, it, I have a different perspective than uh, other people and other people have a different perspective than me. But I, I always want to take it back to the fallen world. This is a fallen world and we lose that perspective. Um, and here's the hardest thing. It's, it's to find right rice it's to find race in the bible the bible is about nations you know and it's a, about borders and territories there, there's no race except the race of adam in the bible and it's so much you're right kevin it's so much about how you frame these things where you bring it from mm -hmm. the news media where most of us get our opinions made for us and because we've sort of been brought up or trained or follow certain well-oiled tracks in our brain processes, sort of jump in uh, and fall in line with the collective mind. Um, the, what am I trying to say? I, I was going to say something profound. Well, just no, just, my head. <laughs> well, that's our age issue. Well, uh, let me help you out. George, you are a min minority in the Anglican communion. In the Anglican communion, the average uh, parishioner is a uh, African woman, uh, most likely uh, unmarried in, from Africa. And that makes up a large, uh, usually your mother, makes up a large proportion of the Anglican communion. Uh, us white guys are a small minority in this church. I like it that way. I have no problem being a minority in the church because the white guys who are trying to lead this church out of England, you know, the, the, the white leadership is not doing a great job in, in, in my humble opinion. So I, I don't mind being uh, led by those who have more melatonin in their skin than myself. So, well, to me, I, I, I think that skin color, uh, that is irrelevant. Yeah. It's the word of God that leads and God raises up different people in different times, in different places to teach and preach and lead with his word. And when we allow the institutions to drive us, when we allow the media to drive us, uh, I remember what I was going to say, now it's quite profound, now it'll sound silly. Uh, the media uh, narrative has been the country is never more divided. The country is divided sharply and will never get together. Well, actually, I can give you an exact, a completely different framing that matches the facts just as closely. 98% of Americans agree that police brutality is bad. Hmm. And 98% of Americans believe that uh, we should respect private property and civil and uh, civil discourse. This, when you have Franklin Graham on the same side as uh, think, Michael yeah, Curry, sure, yeah. on 98% of the issues, you're at a point of unanimity that is rare in life. Is just the handful of professional agitators and kooks and cranks out there who enjoy the violence or who enjoy racial animosity. And if we had competent leadership across the board in uh, politics and the church, we would have people seeking and working on what unites us, what builds us together as a community, rather than, oh, like the Episcopal, my bishop was tweeting out stuff about Donald Trump, and I wrote to him and said, I, you know, I respect your right to offer your political opinion, but realize I've had to field phone calls from people in my parish who are outraged 
that you're on the different political side than they are. Um, I was able to put out the local fires, but how does that build the body of Christ? Then I talked to a, a friend of mine, a, a priest of Puerto Rican extraction, who tells me his congregation are enthralled that the bishop is taking a liberal democratic activist position because that's where his congregation comes from. Mm -hmm. Mine is split down the middle. Uh, well, and, I, so and we've been able successfully uh, over the past six years to keep politics out of the coffee hour and keep Jesus front and center. We, and it's difficult to do. I'm, I am pleased with my local church that uh, politics is not something we talk about frequently. Uh, you know, this is obviously the topic du jour of COVID-19 and the race riots are, you know, fraying some nerves and stuff like that. But in general, we're not, we are not politically active in any way, shape or form at our church. And that's fine. We're Jesus active. That's boom. Love it. Well, Kevin, you're, a you're absolutely right because, you know, as I said, people are still dying. People still want to get married. People still are wrestling with alcoholism and sin and brokenness. Amnity is out there. <laughs> and if we and if we take the time off from okay, you got your problems, but this is more important that I virtue signal and spend my time talking about how right thinking I am, rather than helping you wrestle with the demons and the brokenness in your own life. Why am I a priest? Why you know, what 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 is my calling? Is it to be seen to be be uh, out, uh, on the side of the winners in life, or is to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ? Well, this I, is my personal opinion, but clergy who get involved in politics, the extent that we've seen right, the gap, the Ashenden theorem, that there's an inverse proportion between political activism and spiritual maturity among clergy is at work here. We're seeing it. I think, you know, as humans, as mankind, we, we want to feel better about ourselves in these times. And virtual signaling allows us to do that. Um, it allows us to feel better, and it doesn't solve a thing. There's there's no solution in it. There's no, there's no way forward other than feeling good for yourself. And Kevin, Kevin, how do you respond to Johnson Tamu and Justin Welby releasing a statement telling the Anglican world that white supremacy is bad? Now, I my initial response was. You know, fellas, I was undecided <laughs> yeah, <it's> point, <laughs> until you taught me the way, you know, it, rather than a teaching moment, it was a ridicule moment mm -hmm. that they're basically not trying to teach us or tell us about the saving news of Jesus Christ or eternal truths. Yes, on one level, the message is perfectly correct. Yeah. But on another level, they so mishandled it and were so patronizing and so obviously virtue signaling that the net result is that they're even held in even low if it's possible even lower esteem yeah than uh, before. and be, hear us out there audience white supremacy is bad the problem with the message is it's so clear that it's bad tell us about jesus you know make it make your message not about shaming whites for being white uh, and as I said last week, white shaming is racism too, sorry. Um, you, you need to endemic your message a, a little uh, brighter. Well, sound. this is what George Carey was saying in his uh, Sunday Telegraph piece that mm -hmm. the bishop and other commentators from England, the bishops are silent when they're talking about abortion policies, when talking about issues that really matter to the moral, morality and morals and ethics of the country. But they're willing to pile on a poor political advisor, Dominic Cummings. They're willing to denounce Donald Trump. They're willing to denounce white racism. Mm -hmm. Friends, I take it from a media pro, and I, I think, not to be unkind, but Kevin and I have enough experience in this business to know how it works. Believe me, you do yourself no favors by stating the bleeding obvious and then try to be patted on the head for doing so. I think we should, Kevin and I are going to go on record to say we oppose Adolf Hitler. And you should too. And now we want to be applauded from, for opposing Adolf Hitler. From my heart. You know, not just academically, but from my heart, I find that he was evil. Oof, that felt good. If George, you have a link of, uh, if you have a link of Doctor Evil going evil, <laughs> I think you you could show that in there. But but George, let me <clears throat> assure you, that kind of felt good. 
there was when I when I came up against the evil of Adolf Hitler there for a moment, I felt good inside. That must be why people do it. But are we called to feel good? Or are we called to tell the truth of God's love? Are we called to be narcissists and puff ourselves up and basically find little opportunities for us to show the world how good we are? Or are we called to walk into the hospice room, walk into the room of the sick and the dialing and the poor and the oppressed? I would be so much more impressed uh, with Justin Welby when he drops into hospital rooms during this lockdown if he had not banned other clergy from doing so, and if he hadn't been followed by his press officer. <laughs> now, do, I, now this, do, answer, say, yeah, you know, yeah. Donald Trump, uh, some people whose views I respect in the Anglican world have gotten all bent out of shape of Donald Trump in a photo op in front of a church holding a Bible. What do you expect a politician to do during a political moment? For him, <laughs> and you know, it's, it's in other words, like the Bishop of Washington has all of a sudden discovered that there's something valuable in the Bible. I yeah, or, or that they don't want it on their property. How dare you bring that on our property? Yeah, it, once again, interesting times, historical looping um, of mankind's bad decisions. Uh, I can't wait. Every morning I wake up. How will today top yesterday? Because yesterday was an amazing, chaotic moment in world well, history. I yeah. got to tell you, I wake up in the morning and I look at my phone and I think, oh no, I hope my daughter from Los Angeles has not texted me <laughs> about, oh daddy, I need bail money. I've bail been money. arrested. <laughs> I was marching. Uh, I, well, it's got to be tough to be, you know. Uh, that's a different topic for a different day. We've gone on way too long, and our audience is like, "Yes, Kevin, you've gone on way too long." Um, I'll make the announcement next week, but right after the show, I'm going to a place to pick up something out of storage and take it to a campground and dewinterize it. But I'll talk to you guys about that next week, guys. It's been a wonderful show. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. You've been watching episode 601 of Anglican Unscripted.